All right, so it looks like we're at the top of the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone, I'm Samantha Oakley with ALA's Public Programs Office. I'm pleased to introduce today's webinar, Media Literacy for Adults, Architecture of the Internet. Next slide, please, Hannah. Before we start, I'd like to make a couple of notes about our virtual classroom. Only our presenters have microphone access, but you're welcome to type your questions in the Q&A box. To send a question, move your cursor towards the bottom of the Zoom window and click Q&A. Please also use the Q&A window to communicate any technical issues with ALA staff. Please do not put technical questions in the chat as they could be easily missed if that window is very busy. We will respond to your questions as quickly as possible. Note that this session will be recorded, so if you would like to review any information, you may do so via the archived version that we will send out within 48 hours of this webinar. Next slide, please. Today's webinar is presented by ALA's Public Programs Office as part of Media Literacy Education in Libraries for Adult Audiences, which is made possible in part by a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this webinar do not necessarily represent those of the Institute of Museum and Library Services or of ALA. Next slide, please. As information providers and hubs for lifelong learning, libraries have always been resources for helping communities develop media literacy skills. Now, in the midst of a global pandemic and in an age when we increasingly rely on digital media for information and communication, these critical thinking skills are more important than ever. The Media Literacy Education and Libraries for Adult Audiences project is designed to support libraries in their efforts to improve the media literacy skills of adults in their communities. By tapping the expertise of a diverse group of 30 thought leaders, this project has created a suite of free media literacy resources, including a practitioner's guide and a series of six webinars. In this webinar, which is the third in the series, Natasha Casey will be discussing the various parts of the internet that track your online presence and how to keep patrons knowledgeable and up to date with online security. Next slide, please. As mentioned, Natasha will be our presenter and I'm pleased to introduce her today. Uh, she is a professor of communications at Blackburn College in Carlinville, Illinois, where she teaches media and information literacy and other courses in the Department of English and Communications. She holds a PhD in communication studies from McGill University. Her research interests include critical race theory and critical media and information literacy. Her most recent publications with co-author Spencer Brayton include Not Tolerating It, Tolerating Intolerance, Unpacking Critical Pedagogy in Classrooms and Conferences, and Reflections on Adopting a Critical Media and Information Literacy Pedagogy. She currently serves on the Editorial Advisory Board of the Journal of Media Literacy Education and on the Youth Be Heard Board, an art and media literacy nonprofit organization. Her media and information literacy blog, No Silos, is at natashacasey.com. With that, I'm pleased to turn things over to Natasha. Thanks so much, Samantha. Uh, thanks to the American Library Association and especially Samantha, Sarah, Mary and Hannah for inviting me to present today. Uh, just by way of a little context um, with the former library director at my college, uh, Spencer Brayton, who now works at Wabonzi Community College in Illinois. Uh, the two of us several years ago designed a media and information literacy course for first year and second year undergraduates. So many of the ideas that I'll present today, I also teach in that media and information literacy class at Blackburn College every fall. So some of the things that I'll cover today uh, are sure to be very obvious and, and familiar to you. So I'll ask you to bear with me as we go through some of that material, but hopefully some of the ideas might be less familiar uh, so that you'll get something useful out of uh, the time that we're going to spend uh, together. So with that being said, um, today's topic is what we're calling the architecture of the internet. And I'll explain what I mean by that phrase uh, in just a couple of minutes. But first, I want to give you an idea of where I'm going over the next 40 minutes or so. Next slide, please. So here's a little uh, overview of where I'm going. You'll see there's two sets of big ideas and program starters. And um, these, of course, mirror what's in the practitioner's guide, as Samantha already talked about. And uh, we should have plenty of time at the end for some questions and little interactions. So um, that will be uh, useful also. 
So before we get into uh, the meat of today's presentation, I want to pull back the lens just a little bit and provide a little context. Um, in other words, answer the question, how does the topic that we're discussing today connect to media and information literacy? So we'll start off with a couple of uh, definitions. Hannah, if you'd hit that next slide for me. Great, thanks so much. So information literacy as described by the Association of College and Research um, Libraries in 2015 defined information literacy as a set of integrated abilities encompassing the reflective discovery of information, the understanding of how information is produced and valued, and the use of information in creating new knowledge and participating ethically in communities of learning. So very similar, uh, media literacy is then the ability to access, analyze and communicate information in a variety of forms, including print and non-print messages. Media literacy empowers people to be both critical thinkers and creative producers of an increasingly wide range of messages using image, sound, uh, language and sound. In other words, it's the skillful application of literacy skills to media and technology messages. And I just done what I just did there, what I tell my students never to do, which is read directly from the PowerPoint. Um, but interestingly, I think um, it's helpful to have both of those references because there's a number of commonalities. Right? So even, even though information literacy is typically housed in the library sciences and has that tradition behind it, um, whereas media studies or media literacy is often housed in communications or media studies places, um, there's a lot of overlap between the two of them. So discovery, production, how do you use, how do you value information, um, how do you create media and information, how do you analyze it, how do you evaluate it, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, a, a theorist that I, uh, whose work I like a lot, Marcus Leaning, said we should think about information and media literacy as two sides of the same coin. And I really like that idea because it shows how interconnected they are, right? Information is media, media is information at this point. Um, so it's always been a challenge to be media and information literate, right? However you want to define it. We're not born with these abilities, you know, we're not, you don't come in with a womb with these skills and knowledge sets, right? They have to be learned. Um, but being media and information literate is arguably even harder in the internet age for at least a couple of reasons as the Center for News Literacy notes. Uh, next slide, please, Hannah. So some things on here that they've listed that are different. Um, now, if you think about before the internet, so before the internet, um, scarcity of information was a defining characteristic. Remember when we had to physically go somewhere to find that information? I still have nightmares about microfiches. I don't know how you feel about it. Um, but of course, we have the opposite problem today, and that is information overload. So, you know, you do a search and you have five million answers. How do you sift through that, figure out what's reliable? Um, some other things that the uh, Center for News Literacy uh, pointed out um, are listed on here. So um, the, the speed, um, this accelerated speed um, and, and the conflict that arises out of this speed between our uh, information um, also, we have new technologies to share and to create and share, right? And that brings some problems with it as well. And um, the last one on, on the list has probably gotten the most mainstream attention in the last few years is that technology makes it much easier to select only the information that supports our pre-existing beliefs rather than reinforce, uh, reinforcing rather than challenging them, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about this idea as we go through um, the presentation. Um, so um, I think as we'll see today, the way that the internet works, the technology itself is making, essentially, right, making choices for us. And I think that's why it's such an important topic for everyone to understand, because without this knowledge, people assume that Google searches are neutral or that we all receive the same information. But um, as I mentioned already, uh, at least the last three presidential elections, if not more, have demonstrated that depending on one's view, we're very much siloed by our ideologies. And sometimes this is by choice, but it's also due in part to the technology itself, um, as we just was pointed out by the Center for News Literacy. And so that's why this topic is so important. And I'm so happy to be chatting um, about it with you here today. 
Next slide, please, Hannah. So Nielsen reported a couple of years ago that American adults consume quite a bit of media. Um, in fact, about 11 hours a day, as you can see from this stat on here. And of course, this involves multitasking, right? We might have the radio on in the kitchen, you might have the telly on in your living room, or you might be on the, you know, you might be checking social media while you're watching a program. So, right, this is not 11 dedicated hours, um, but we have overlap between them. Um, but I think what's interesting about this, uh, first of all, that's a lot of media we're consuming every day. Next slide, please, Hannah. But increasingly, that media is centered around the Internet. Uh, and this is no surprise at all, I'm sure, to most of you. According to the Pew Research Center, this is from 2019, um, roughly eight in 10 US adults go online at least daily. Um, I think it will be really interesting to see how the pandemic has affected that number. Um, you know, if it's gone up or down, if people have less or more access as a result um, of just what's happened in the last uh, year or so. But if you look at that um, Pew Research uh, little diagram there, what you'll also see is that 28% of US adults report that they are almost constantly online. Um, so that's pretty, that's pretty amazing at this point, right? 30, almost 30%. So um, with so much time spent online, a key feature of media and information literacy is that we all need to have a better understanding of this architecture of the internet. And what I basically mean by that is, you know, how the digital environment functions. Um, if you could go to the next slide for me, Hannah, thank you. Um, and so how the digital environment functions, what do I mean by that? So although we, we make every day, right, what seem like very individual decisions and choices based on where we go online, such as what websites we're gonna to go to, what apps we use, there's also at the same time, this largely invisible system at work that tailors and personalizes online content based on where on the internet you've been before. And also based on what various sites and platforms um, think you might like. And so this, this, is, this is what we mean by the architecture of the internet, this invisible system. Next slide, please. So this includes, this system includes how differentiated, personalized media experiences and algorithms right, influence our access to content. Um, sometimes that leads to polarization and groupthink. Sometimes it commodifies our personal information. Um, it also is, um, when we use the phrase architecture of the internet, we're looking at how media business models, you know, whether your content is free or it's behind a paywall, how that affects users' understanding and interpretation of information. So understanding the internet's architecture is the first step toward um, informed decision-making about operating within a digital space. Whereas we just learned, right? Most people, myself included, and I'm sure plenty of you are spending a lot of time and a lot of attention these days. Next slide, please. So the first two foundational ideas of operating within a digital space are cookies and algorithms. And, you know, I'm certainly no computer scientist and sometimes my eyes might, you know, glaze over when you start hearing some of these technical terms. But um, I found that at, at least when I'm teaching my students, these are two pretty foundational ideas for them to understand everything else that um, sort of builds on these two. So let's start with a basic definition of a cookie. Uh, next slide, Hannah, please. And just hit it again for me. So you can all just have enough time to admire my little uh, cookie movement there. So cookies, a piece of data stored on a person's computer by a website to enable the site to remember useful information, such as previous browsing history on the site or sign in, for, sign in information, right? And that's super helpful. You know, we don't want to always be putting in our, our passwords. We don't always want to remember which email we use on a particular site. Uh, so some of these, some of these things are helpful. Um, and to, to help my students understand how cookies work, and I think this could also work for maybe you and your patrons, is um, just, I, I show them this very short uh, video that I'm gonna play for you now, or Hannah is anyway. It's produced by the Guardian newspaper out of England. And like I said, I think it makes for a great program starter 
um, to introduce this idea of cookies. A cookie is a tiny file dropped by your browser onto your computer's hard drive when you visit a site. They contain records of your interaction. For instance, what you clicked on or whether you are signed into the site. They don't collect personal data from your hard drive. They simply carry the data created by your browser. When you enter a web address into your browser, a search is made for existing cookies associated with that site. Not all cookies hang around forever. Some are deleted automatically when you close your browser or after a period of inactivity. Others simply expire. And not all cookies do the same thing. Some remember how you like things set up. Others work out where you are in the world. Whether you'd like to stay signed in, which adverts you've seen and which you've clicked on. And some use your browsing patterns to create an anonymous profile of you. When certain cookies, or combination of cookies, exist on your computer, your anonymous profile puts you into an audience segment. Advertisers use these segments to deliver adverts they believe would be most relevant to you. This is targeted advertising. It doesn't identify you personally or use personal data to define what you might be interested in. It uses the profile created by your cookies. Without cookies, you'd still see adverts on the internet but they'd be less relevant to you in your search history. Sometimes cookies are set, not by the site you're visiting, but by the organisations who advertise on that site. This can result in information about your internet use being shared with third parties. They use it to deliver targeted advertising to you and to help measure its success. These are called third-party cookies. You can see who's dropping third-party cookies by adding Ghostery, a free privacy tool, onto your browser. You can see what these cookies do and choose the ones you want and which ones you'd like to turn off. You can also turn off third-party tracking cookies by changing your browser settings. Some sites are now starting to use technologies other than cookies to perform similar functions, which remember you using other identifiers from your computer, such as device numbers. If you want to know what is happening, read the privacy policy on websites to find out. This not Great. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. So that's just a little introduction to cookies. I think it just helps people. It certainly helps my students uh, figure out some of the bigger issues that come afterwards. So um, alongside cookies, um, the other big idea here, of course, are the other foundational idea uh, to understand the architecture of the internet, I think, is algorithms. Uh, and a simple definition of an algorithm is a set of instructions to be followed to carry out um, a task. And of course, you know, um, algorithms predate uh, computers. But um, when we put it together, when we put algorithms in the context of contemporary internet use, they're, they're basically driving what's called content amplification. So whether that's the next video on YouTube, you know, if you don't switch off, um, you know, that sort of view, that um, setting that uh, prevents the next video from playing, then you're likely to be watching your cat videos over and over again. Um, that's just me uh, on my cat videos. I'm not accusing you of doing that. Um, same thing works with ads on Facebook or things you might like on Amazon or other shopping websites, right? So basically the idea is to keep you on that site you, or in that app. Um, so it serves a very specific economic um, process or purpose, as you can see here. Uh, next slide, please. So although algorithms, like I said, predate computers, um, they really have a profound impact on society, on politics, on the news, as Alison Head, Barbara Feaster, and Margie McMillan point out in their research. And algorithms also have a profound impact on epistemology, right? How we know what we know about the world. And that's a pretty you know, massive thing to think about. And yet most algorithms are easy to ignore since we can't see, hear, or touch them, they go on to argue. So while they're hard at work, many of us do not give much thought to the hidden minutia of their constantly changing proprietary formulas. So their lines of complex and opaque code make lightning fast decisions for and about us in both helpful and uh, unhelpful ways. Next slide, please. And um, that's taken from a report that I'll quote a couple of times here. Um, I think it came from last year. 
um, it was released last year about information literacy in the age of algorithms. And if this is something that floats your boat, I definitely highly recommend um, a read of this report. Next slide, please. Um, as Alison uh, Head and Feaster, et cetera, point out, it wasn't until the word Google really became synonymous with searching online in the early 2000s that the idea of algorithms really started to um, enter into the public consciousness. Um, and so this, the same authors go on in the study to talk about the um, central role they play in our lives. Come on, you spurs, indeed. So somebody's already beat me to my slide. So here's a great example, right, of way an algorithm will work on Facebook. So this is from my own uh, Facebook page. And of course, I love Tottenham Hotspurs. If you don't know who they are, how have you lived this long? They are London's, indeed England's greatest football team, possibly the world's but we can talk about that later. So when I go on my Facebook page, you know, I'll always see Tottenham Hotspur here. Um, that'll be the first thing that will show um, to me. And then I'll get these, um, you know, uh, adverts, right? Sponsored content around uh, fashion football um, online boutique, which is a weird way of saying they're, they're trying to sell me some football jerseys. Um, so like, this is a pretty innocuous example, right? Um, so cookies and algorithms basically work because of what I've already fed into the internet machine, and that can be helpful, right? Uh, and it's estimated that about um, 1,500 points of data um, are, co are collected. It's probably more than that now um, for every American. So um, through our you know, cookies and algorithms online. So it doesn't matter where I log in, you know, if I'm going to use um, something that that connects me to a device or connects me to a, a Google account, a Gmail account in some way um, or another account, they're going to know um, something about me. Right. Um, um, and of course, in this case, that I'm a massive football um, or soccer club, as you guys say. Um, so next slide, please. Likewise, um, many of the cookies and algorithms uh, will also know that I would never want to see any commercials or promotions for Spurs' arch rival club. They're called Arsenal. Um, and so this, is, again, is a very innocuous example of how cookies and algorithms work in our favor. Next slide, please. So media literacy researcher Renee Hobbs pointed out that today algorithmic personalization is present nearly every time users use the internet and it shapes the offerings displayed for information entertainment and persuasion and she points out that there are three routine and common types of algorithmic personalization that affect our lives every single day okay so the first one are filtered search results and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute or two the second on the list uh, is targeted advertising I've just talked about that and the third one on the list is this idea of differential pricing and that's a topic covered in Joseph Tarot's book, um, which is also on the slide here, in which he notes that, quote, online shoppers who live in wealthy neighborhoods are offered products at different prices than those in less affluent um, neighborhoods. And if you could hit it one more time as well, um, there's just a line from a report, a ProPublica report about um, some of the controversies over Amazon's uh, differential pr uh, pricing. So. Like I've said throughout, there's positive and, and negative consequences to this architecture. If you purchase an item on Amazon, the website might suggest similar items you might like. And many consumers, of course, will find this convenient and, and retailers do it, of course, to, to boost sales. Next slide, please. Um, most everyone, I think, and this is why it's relatable, um, I think for your patrons as it is for my students, uh, most everyone has an example of how they search for something and then ads for that product showed up in all kinds of spaces online. But as the Harvard Business Review points out, with personalized ads, there's a fine line between creepy and delightful. Uh, next slide, please. So even though, as uh, this Wired magazine from a few years ago um, argued, recommendation algorithms run the world, and uh, I, I already mentioned the previously uh, the report by Head Feaster and Macmillan point out all kinds of decisions about our lives are made this way, whether it's insurance coverage decisions, whether it's medical analytics, um, credit card eligibility decisions. These are all increasingly subject to algorithms. 
Um, but still, most of the general public is unfamiliar with how cookies and algorithms account for most of what we see online in our daily Google searches. And of course, this is compounded by the fact that most companies such as Google, even though they control about 90% of the search engine business in the US, if you'd hit that next slide for me, Hannah, please. So um, Google and others, of course, but most especially Google, because they do dominate the market in this country, um, are less than forthcoming about how their algorithms work. And of course, they're constantly changing as well, um, making this process uh, trickier all the time. Uh, next slide, please. But I think understanding at least the basic principle of algorithms is key to understanding everything that we do online, um, because as this uh, article pointed out, today's Internet is basically ruled by algorithms. These mathematical um, creations determine what we see in your Facebook feed, what movies Netflix recommends you and what ads you see in your Gmail. And I think compounding this issue even a little bit more is that many people think of search engines as neutral or objective, as I said before. But as Renee Hobbs points out, algorithms are created by people whose own biases may be embodied in the code they write. And many researchers, of course, including Sophia Emoja Noble and others, uh, next slide, please, Hannah, uh, have documented numerous examples of all kinds of data failures specific to people of color and women, showing how these Google searches reinforce stereotypes of um, African-American women and others. Um, Head, Feaster and Macmillan say the algorithm is only reflecting what it has been taught to believe and often by a very homogenous group of people. Um, and I just put up there three great books that sort of uh, deal with this issue. Uh, if you have any interest in it, um, they're all worth checking out. Um, particularly Ruha Benjamin's Race After Technology is a really um, fantastic insight um, into this phenomenon. Next slide, please. But that's why I think uh, Doug Belshaw, uh, who created this uh, image you see right now, he contends that fake news is the tip of the iceberg. Right. And it's a, obviously something that garners a lot of mainstream media attention with good reason. But he argues, basically, we need to pay much more attention to what's underneath the iceberg, right, the far bigger iceberg. And part of that is this algorithmic curation. Um, and he says that we should be focusing our, our time and energy um, on understanding that in order to understand what, the, you know, the little piece that we see that's visible at the top. Next slide, Hannah, please. Um, so that Fister report that I uh, and, uh, and her associates wrote this report, I think it's last year, um, and they did a, just a little um, survey on what worries students about uh, computer algorithms. And um, you can see there's a whole list um, of items there, and maybe they also, um, you know, are, are of interest to you or also worry you. And some of the things on this list, of course, are pretty significant, like online users not seeing the same reality, um, platforms selling personal data to third parties. Next slide, please, Hannah. Right, it's, it's enough to make me at least want to go find a, a brown bag and take a few moments, right? It's a lot, it's, it can be pretty overwhelming. But I think part of dealing with this feeling, if, if you're like me at all and sometimes feel this way, is that at least having some idea of how these things work, um, you know, could go some way to easing uh, the process, I think, a little bit. So next slide, please. The other uh, two foundational ideas of understanding this architecture of the Internet are filter bubbles and confirmation bias. And uh, hopefully you can see um, you know, how these build on what we just uh, talked about or their connections to the two things that we just talked about, cookies and algorithms. So just like we did last time, let's first of all start with uh, some basic definitions so we can start to see why it's important that every Internet user understands how cookies and algorithms help create filter bubbles, how it creates uh, confirmation bias, and echo chambers. So I'm just gonna read these um, off here, filter bubbles. So that's intellectual isolation that results from information served primarily through search engines that filters results based on this personalized data, right? So obviously I live in a filter bubble um, 
where spurs are the best in the world. This might be arguable for other people, but that's my filter bubble. There are also other things, maybe more significant things other than football in that bubble too. Uh, confirmation bias, that's the tendency to prioritize information that confirms or aligns with our own viewpoint, right? I don't want to read any defenses of Arsenal Football Club when I go online. I want, I want my, well, my bias confirmation. Uh, and of course, the result of that is that um, it's a bit of an echo chamber in it. Um, so information can come from many different sources, but when you're only hearing that same perspective over and over again, um, you, you know, you're going to be in an echo chamber. And let's face it, we like our echo chambers, don't we? Um, and that's also part of the problem, um, of course, is that we, you know, uh, we, we enjoy that a little bit too much. OK, so it's kind of like, you know, the idea of uh, egocentric thinking, but in a, a digital space. Next slide, please, Hannah. So once we understand, um, you know, how these filter bubbles and echo chambers um, alongside, you know, exist um, because of the algorithms and the cookies, um, maybe we would be able to even understand our own cognitive dissonance a little bit more once we encounter information or ideas beyond our own filter bubbles. So um, I love this quote from Julie Frechette on here. She says, despite a plethora of diverse perspectives abounding in online digital networks, most individuals stop seeking content when they have found enough information to confirm the views that they are already prejudiced towards. Now, I've been using, you know, just my own little humorous football analogy all the way through this, but it, it's obviously like a lot more serious than this, right? And um, arguably is even affecting uh, the country as a whole, democracy, politics, our abilities to talk to people who have different views from ourselves, right? The ramifications of this are, are pretty enormous. Um, Okay, uh, so I want to talk about a great way to get into this topic that I've used several times in class, um, and that is to screen, even though it's, old, it's a few years old by now, um, this TED Talk by Ellie Pariser called uh, Beware Online Filter Bubbles. Uh, and you might know him because he co-founded um, Upworthy. You know, it's one of these websites that they only publish you know, positive news. Um, and he wrote a book on it too, um, the same idea and it's it's really written in a very accessible manner which is one thing I like about it so this could also be a good choice for a book club and discussion as well and so in the TED talk and I'll show you a clip here in a minute or two um, in the TED talk Pariser explains that uh, quote personalization on Netflix embodies the filter bubble paradox as you provide more information to Netflix the less likely it is that you will encounter films outside your comfort zone and the narrower your choice options will become. So, you know, it's almost uh, goes against rational thinking here. Like the more you're feeding into the machine, you would think the wider it might get. But um, as Pariser points out, um, especially in these places like next Netflix, um, the narrower your choices become. And uh, one of the things I learned last year from a, a librarian a friend of mine was how to get around the Netflix algorithm, like how to look up things that you could, um, you know, get out of it. It was get out of that filter bubble, um, which was pretty, pretty cool to learn. Anyway, um, before we watch a little bit of a quote here, um, what's the problem with this? Uh, Renee, as Renee Hobbs puts it, and she's quoting another critic here, she says, recommendation engines simply do not take into account the unknowable, the eclectic, and the ever-changing process of individual taste formation. You know, if somebody's going to keep showing me those, you know, Spurs highlights from all the glory years, like that's what I'm going to go watch. But if I'm recommended something else, that's not Arsenal, but something else, maybe not even related to football, you know, maybe I'll watch that instead. So, um, but like, think about it, like we're all more complex than the one or, you know, than the few things that we fed into the algorithm here. Um, but most times they don't take that into account, right? That unknowable, that eclecticism, um, that most people have. And that idea that, you know, uh, tastes change uh, over the years and decades, except for Spurs, that never changes. Okay, so let's watch a couple and a half minutes of this. Thank you, Hannah.
Mark Zuckerberg, a journalist, was asking him a question about the news feed. And the journalist was asking him, you know, why is this so important? And Zuckerberg said, a squirrel dying in your front yard may be more relevant to your interests right now than people dying in Africa. And I want to talk about what a web based on that idea of relevance might look like. So when I was growing up in a, in a really rural area in Maine, you know, the internet meant something very different to me. It, it meant uh, a connection to the world. It meant something that would connect us all together. And I, I was sure that it was going to be great for democracy and for our society. But there's this kind of shift in how information is flowing online. And it's invisible. And if we don't pay attention to it, it could be a real problem. So I first noticed this uh, in a place I spend a lot of time, my Facebook page. I'm progressive politically, big surprise, but I've always uh, you know, gone out of my way to meet conservatives. I like hearing what they're thinking about, I like seeing what they link to, I like learning a thing or two. And so I was kind of surprised when I noticed one day that the conservatives had disappeared from my Facebook feed. And uh, what it turned out was going on was that Facebook was looking at which links I clicked on. And it was noticing that actually I was clicking more on my liberal friends links than on my conservative friends links. And without consulting me about it, it had edited them out. They disappeared. So Facebook isn't the only place that's doing this kind of invisible algorithmic editing of the web. Google's doing it too. If I search for something and you search for something, even right now at the very same time, we may get very different search results. Even if you're logged out, one engineer told me, there are 57 signals that Google looks at. Everything from what kind of computer you're on, to what kind of browser you're using, to where you're located, that it uses to personally tailor your query results. Think about it for a second. There is no standard Google anymore. And you know, the funny thing about this is that it's hard to see. You can't see how different your search results are from anyone else's. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, I asked a bunch of friends to Google Egypt and to send me screenshots of what they got. So here's my friend uh, Scott's screenshot. And here's my friend Daniel's screenshot. When you put them side by side, you don't even have to read the links to see how different these two pages are. But when you do read the links, it's really quite remarkable. Daniel you can didn't get anything there, about Hannah, the protests please. in Egypt at all. And Thanks so much, Hannah. Uh, just to give you a little flavor, if you've never seen that TED Talk, it's great. I think it's very accessible and you can start a, you know, a really good discussion um, about, uh, about these ideas. So the last thing I want to do with you before we open it up for questions is just give you a couple of um, more um, sort of ideas for what to do for program starters. Um, uh, so, yeah, sorry, before I do that, though, I should say, you know, here are some of the kinds of questions you could ask um, after you've screened Paris, Pariser's uh, TED Talk. Um, and just to, you know, open up a discussion about it um, usually works pretty well, at least when I do it in class. OK, so a few um, other program starters and then I'll call it a day and look forward to chatting with you and hearing your questions. Next slide, Hannah, please. Oh, you're way ahead of me. Um, so a great one to do is um, uh, I, again, it's connected to this. I think you might have jumped one. Would you go back one? No, you didn't. You're right on. It's me. It's not me. It's not you. It's me. Um, another good one to, um, you know, think about and also um, get your patrons to be aware of is that the default setting um, is on their smart televisions um, is usually set to on. And that is on in terms of microphone access and on in terms of advertisers tracking you. Um, so very closely related to these ideas of filter bubbles and echo chambers is the concept of privacy, of course. And you know, what, what are your patrons thoughts about, about being tracked online? Um, do they even know that their microphone access is usually defaulted to on and that advertisers are tracking them as they're using their television? 
Um, and and I, I ask students what else is listed in their privacy settings um, and then ask them, you know, what did you learn? What did you change? Um, and if they don't have a smart TV, but watch television via some kind of app, whether it's Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime, you know, I ask them visit those privacy settings, ask the same kinds of questions. What did you learn? What did you change? Next slide, Hannah, please. Uh, this is also a really good TED talk um, about what your smart devices know and share about you. Um, it's a, a one part terrifying and one part uh, hilarious as you think about all the devices potentially in your home that are now smart devices, whether that's a toothbrush or your fridge, or, um, you know, your tellies we've already talked about. Um, so um, this is another um, great place that you can go online and look at this. Next slide, please. Uh, another good one to do is, um, Hannah hit that first one, um, is, is to run this diagnostic on your computer or your phone, and you can get a list of all the companies that are actually tracking you at uh, your online behavior. And on average, there's about 135 companies at any one time. Um, that's just an average number that are tracking your behavior online. And what's interesting about it is if you look at those companies, um, most of them are not household names, you know, you wouldn't recognize them outside of your Googles and your Facebooks. And so then I have students, you know, maybe look up one of those companies and see what they see what they're about. Um, and then you can opt out when you run the diagnostic, you can also opt out. So it's, it's pretty good um, that way as well. And again, sparks a whole discussion around this um, topic. Do people care? Some people don't care. Um, and that's fine. Why or why not? Um, let's see one more, I think one more program starter. And that is, again, this is a few years old, but I think um, it's still still worth a look. Uh, terms and conditions may apply. Um, it's a documentary, but they also have a really good site um, that includes a discussion and activity guide, a whole resource um, page to help organize your program. And um, again, it goes into some of these things about being uh, tracked online and um, privacy issues, surveillance issues, these kinds of questions. And um, it's already built in it, into their own website. You know, you've got all of these guides to help you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and again, you know, these are the kinds of questions that you can ask your uh, patrons, um, which I think uh, will be helpful. Okay, two slides left. One is resources. And again, most of this stuff is listed in the practitioner's guide, so I'm not going to spend um, too much time on it. Um, I'm going to just say to you, like, I hope you got something out of it. I hope maybe there's a way that you can start a discussion about the architecture of the internet with your patrons, uh, maybe even with your colleagues. Um, but the second most important thing maybe that you can take away is, next slide, Hannah, please, um, of course, is how awesome Spurs are and who their arch rivals, whenever you hear their name, you should boo, boo out loud. Um, so that does it for me. I think I'm pretty close to being on time um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Natasha. Um, so it looks like we have a little bit over 15 minutes left. Um, and I see that quite a few of you have been entering your questions in the Q&A box already. Um, so just in case any of you have questions and haven't been paying attention to the Q&A, uh, go ahead and enter those questions in there now. Um, you can also read through your fellow attendees what they've been asking and upvote any that you really want us to get to before the end of the session. So um, the first question is from Amy, and she is wondering if you could share the librarian's trick with them about getting out of the Netflix filter bubble. Oh, I should have never brought that up because I knew somebody <laughs> would ask me how to do it. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, no, there was a whole series of steps that you have to take. And off the top of my head, I wouldn't remember how to do it because I have to always go back and reference her, her PowerPoint to do it. Um, but yeah, if there's somewhere I can share it with you, I'd be happy to do it because it was fabulous. And we were all astonished. You know, you could look up, uh, it was a webinar just like this and you could look up, you know, films in another genre, things that aren't showing up um, on your Netflix list. And for me, because my, my partner dominates it and it's like full of ridiculous, like, uh, you know, documentaries about World War II and stuff. I'm like, where's the where's the Irish action genre? Why does that never show up on my on my list? And now I know why. 
but yeah, if I can find out a way to share it with you, I will for sure. Great. Um, so the next question is by Danelle, um, and they are wondering how much does an incognito search protect you from cookies and algorithms? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and really, uh, I think from the research that I've done about this, I think those kinds of places and spaces online are, are less private than you might think they are. Um, and that there's very few spaces online, unless you're a real computer science you know, nerd who can figure out how to um, you know, um, get out of those spaces. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure, but honestly, like I don't know, I would say I wouldn't know enough about incognito specifically to answer that, but from, from the things I've read about it, um, people who know more than I say that increasingly spaces like that online um, are still trackable some way. Great. Um, so the next one is from an anonymous attendee, and um, I'm going to try and paraphrase because it's a little bit long, but they're basically saying that they read a recent paper um, that presents filter bubbles and echo chambers as two distinct phenomena. Um, and they find they found that getting echo chambers are much harder to get out of because they function not by omission, but by active discrediting of other viewpoints and information. Mm -hmm. um, how do we address active sowing of distrust in the library based on this? Cool. That's not a hard question to answer. <laughs> no, well. right? Let me, let me put you on the spot. <laughs> let me uh, just take 30 seconds and deal with that. Um, yes, that it, it is a good observation, but I'm thinking about you know, when I teach this, and I think this is probably true for most of you in your library spaces, although I'm making an assumption here, um, you're thinking about this for a general audience. Um, and I think even if a general audience can grasp these, then they can, you know, then they can move forward from there and start parsing out and understanding more of the nuances involved. Um, but yeah, how do we, <laughs> how do we, the second part of that question, Samantha, what was it like? How do we actively uh, um, cover the sowing of disinformation in the library? Yeah, I mean, what I'm offering here, I suppose, uh, is really individual choices. And there's definitely a critique to be made of that, right? There are some other things that probably need to happen within media industries like uh, regulation and um, um, yeah, maybe media literacy, information literacy, in schools, um, you know, we, we need to see some maybe um, statewide action, which we're starting to see movement on, um, but it can't all be down to the individual um, either, I think. So it's, it's a mixture, right? Basically what I'm saying, there's probably a mixture of answers and responses, responses to this dilemma. Great, and these two questions that are next kind of feed into one of another, so I'm gonna kind of tie them together. Um, Gregory, Gregory and Sarah are wondering about VPNs. Um, first, do they actually offer any protection from online mm. tracking? And if so, do you have any that you would recommend? Um, I have gone down this road. I will, I will make this admission um, uh, in this webinar that I have definitely tried to, in order to access uh, content from, let's just say, other countries. Um, that's, <laughs> that might be protected in the States. Um, but I'm a little leery of using some of them because um, again, I'm not a computer scientist, right? Um, so um, I wouldn't know enough about the technical specs on VPNs to either recommend one or no. I have tested a couple myself um, uh, with mixed results. Um, but there's there's got to be some, you know, there's probably uh, other people that you could talk to who know more about it than I would and could recommend something for you. Um, I always go to my computer science friends, people when I when I need help with that. So sorry. No, I'm not a computer scientist. Definitely not. Um, the next question is from Drea. Uh, they are wondering if uh, media includes print. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think when you say, and that, that's why, you know, it's kind of a potato, patata thing, isn't it? Like librarians will probably use information literacy more 
but people like myself who've been in communications and media studies will say media literacy but when we say media or, or information I think you're talking about everything like print telly film um, and you know what makes it complicated is that they've all converged right into this digital technology so once they were separate now they're all converged what does that mean for our understanding what does it mean for our, the relationships between them what does it mean for um, the way we're tracked online across all of these areas um, so yeah media in the broadest sense always yeah absolutely and then um, their second question that ties into that is does it include pressure pleasure reading as part of media yeah definitely uh, I think when you're talking about media literacy you know what the little piece that I focused on today is is more of the um, you know maybe some of the sort of I wouldn't say quite finger wagging, but maybe sort of alarmist aspects of media literacy. Um, but of course, a big part of why we um, engage with media in the first place is that pleasurable component, right? Is the community that gets built out of love of pop culture or other artifacts, right? That are media, whether that's music or television programs or films, um, it really does connect us to other people, it forms communities and any, conversation about this with um, particularly with college age students I think reveals this so yeah it's also understanding your the relationship on a on a participatory but also pleasure level that's why we engage with it right I mean my my I would say just to really you know flog the dead cat here but you know my love of Spurs isn't just about the football team right and the games itself it's about the community that's built with other people around that, you know, the fandom that's created around it. And of course, pleasure is a big part of that pain also in the case of Spurs, but yes, pleasure sometimes occasionally. Great. Um, the next question is from Michelle and they're wondering um, for people who say they don't care about online privacy and things that you talked about today, um, could you say why they should care? Yeah, I think when people say they don't care, it's because they don't really they don't really understand. And um, I, I think that's that's the open ended part of the question is that even some of these companies haven't figured out what they're going to do with that data yet. Right. They haven't figured out um, all the uses for that data. Um, so I'm not sure I really buy that argument. I mean, uh, sometimes I compare it to the um, offline online. Like, would you want anybody coming into your house? you know, looking at anything in your, you know, how private are the things in your house? Do you think what you do online should be as private or not? Or, um, yeah, I get that response quite a bit, I would say in class, but then I think you'd start breaking it down and students, and at least in my case, students really don't know, um, you know, how they're being tracked. So they have some vague uh, understanding that they are, but they really don't know. Um, so I think by introducing some of these concepts, I think it does make people care. We have to care because, you know, something has to be done about it. Right. And then um, the next question is from Michelle. Um, so we kind of started running out of time and you uh, kind of breeze past the duck, duck, go. Uh, they're just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how it's different from the search engine of Google. Yeah, sure. I actually I did. I talked about this in class yesterday. I had students look at um, 17 alternatives to Google and um, some of them are just search engines based abroad, you know, so it'd be interesting to compare those kinds of search results. Um, and a couple of them were um, ones that don't track you. And I th we're starting to see um, and we have over the last 10, 15 or more years, um, one of which is DuckDuckGo, which basically doesn't use cookies to follow you around the internet. So it's not, so every time you put in a, a, a search, um, you're getting a list that looks very different from Google on there usually, um, you know, because the ways in which the, the search engines work are not, are not neutral, right? And they're not all the same. Um, so yeah, uh, DuckDuckGo is one. Um, but people get frustrated with it because, of course, the great thing about Google, right, the great thing in quotation marks is that it's given you back the things that you like most. So when you when you want to like when I do a search for, I don't know, I have a student working on a paper and I'll put in something, it'll usually take me to where I want to go, whereas on places like DuckDuckGo, it doesn't have any of that um, information stored. 
so the results you're getting are, are um, not as immediately obviously connected to what you're looking for and that's why people get frustrated with it but I use it quite a bit I just like to see like what the difference is um, between DuckDuckGo and others um, a student pointed out to me yesterday that there's one called uh, there's a search engine called uh, Ecosia or Ecosia I don't know if you've heard of this one E-C-O-S-I-A and um, apparently it's got some environmental sort of bent to it and for every 45 searches there's a there's a tree being planted apparently somewhere I don't know haven't checked it out yet haven't fact checked it yet but on a call with a bunch of librarians somebody will tell me if that's baloney in a minute I'm sure um, yeah, someone already posted that they know the search engine that you're uh, okay. talking about. Um, so the in, same along the search engine question. So Maureen is wondering if uh, quant, Q-W-A-N-T dot com uh, really doesn't track them. I don't know. Um, I've not heard of it, um, but I just wrote it down so I can look it up. Yeah, I never heard of that one either. Um, so again, with the search engines, does the browser that you're using uh, make a difference? Yeah, for sure, right? Definitely. How you're plugged into that browser, the way, you know, if you're logged into, like my school is completely ensconced in Google, you know, it's Google everything. So I have to log in, which means it's tracking me around um, everything I do online. Um, and it's hard to break out of that when you need it for school. But um, yeah, I try to avoid signing in outside of schoolwork as much as possible. But I mean, it's like even even in that filter bubble clip we we showed, which is 10 years old now, you know, there are other identifiers. I mean, everybody's connected to their device. There's a unique you know, number on your device or your computer that connects you to the information you're searching. And sometimes that's good. Right. We want people who are like murderers and pedophiles to be able to be caught that way. Um, but then it's like, what are the what are the companies doing with the data? I mean, I think that's the question um, that we have to move to next. Um, it's so secretive um, what they're doing. We know that they're selling it, but what exactly are they selling? Yeah, and I see that we've had several questions come through about um, the resources as well as copies of the PowerPoint and a transcript of the chat. So um, yes, all this will be shared with you um, in a follow-up email. And also you can download a copy of um, the list of resources as well as a copy of the PowerPoint um, from the website that I just posted in the chat. Um, so the next question is from Nick. And this will probably be our last question. Um, so. They are wondering if instructional material exists on tracing YouTube algorithms in search in service of ad revenue. Ooh, I'm sure it does. <laughs> I, off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, you know, this is interesting because yesterday I was just having this conversation with a couple of my students who are interested in TikTok's algorithm. And of course, this is part of the problem is that um, again they're so secretive they don't want to release like how they're doing what they're doing it's it's basically corporate secret so um anything to do with an algorithm and i think this is the other part that's ever changing whether it's youtube or whatever um it's unlikely to be readily available although i'm sure there are people much smarter than i doing work on it um, but sorry that's a long-winded way of saying no i don't Great. And with that, I think we're going to wrap up. So I just want to say a huge thank you to you, Natasha, for this excellent presentation. I also want to thank my colleagues behind the scenes, Sarah Osman, Mary Davis Fournier, and Hannah Arada for their support on this webinar. Um, to hear more from Natasha, you can follow her on Twitter. And I don't have your Twitter handle right in front of me, but if you want to uh, call that out really quick or sure. drop it in the chat. Yeah, it's at Natasha IRL, not in real life but Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> Very 
very nice. <laughs> um, if you have any questions uh, that we were unable to get to in the session, feel free to email us at publicprograms.ala.org. Uh, this presentation has been offered as part of Media Literacy Education and Libraries for Adult Audiences project with support from a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The archived version of this session will be available to view on programminglibrarian.org within 48 hours. Thank you to everyone for joining us today.